All right, so those uh, those few minutes went pretty quickly here, I think. Um, we are going to jump in, and I want you to know that during this, um, this teaching, we're going to have the ability for you to speak in the chat room also, and you can pay attention to what other people are saying. I have a facilitator working with me, Annette. You might get to meet her in the process, and she can answer questions for you as they come up. So we're really glad that you're with us, and feel free to put those in. I just want to give you a little background on what this course is and maybe who I am that might help uh, get some clarification. My name is Rob Lloyd. I'm a senior pastor at Freedom Community church but i'm also a chaplain and i work in uh, multiple trauma response type of units uh, including with schools and i've done work internationally and nationally and uh, so i've got a lot of experience working with trauma intervention uh, with people i'm our clinical director of a, a critical incident stress management team here in southwest washington so this is something we do um, as a large team of about 30 plus people and uh, we just want to give you some information. But before we do, because I know this is Mission Connection. Connection. Most of the work that we do is here in the United States. And so uh, as I give you this course, I'm going to give you information that is really pertinent to work in the United States. And I'm going to ask you to use your creativity to try to figure out um, how that might change or the variables uh, change for you. In some places that will be very significant and others it will be uh, minor modifications to what you would normally do. And so uh, we can have chat about that. You can ask further questions. We'll give you a way to reach us uh, later if you have those questions. Uh, but hopefully um, you'll find many of these pieces transfer over very well and that they're useful for you in the setting that you work in wherever that might be. I also want to say this isn't a theology course. Um, again, uh, what I've been asked to do is come to you not as a pastor, because that's my uh, vocation, but to come to you as a chaplain. And so I'm not going to deal a lot with theology here. I'm going to deal more with the practical helps of what we do. Um, and I'm going to kind of break this up into basically four different parts. I want to give you an introduction as to uh, what's going on and what we're going to be talking about. I want to tell you what the problems are inside of that topic, which today happens to be crisis fatigue. Then we're gonna talk about the responses that people have uh, based on uh, these situations coming into their life. And then finally, what can we do about it? So I wanna give you some tools to work with. So let's deal with the first part. First part, um, long-term and unresolved stress uh, can create a whole host of potential problems. Um, it can increase what we call situational depression, which is obviously a depression that comes on by a a strong event or uh, something that happens very suddenly. And so uh, I want you to know that we can have a, a situational depression event, but we can also have an increase from prolonged and intense stress or unresolved stress um, that can result in a uh, heightened clinical depression state. In other words, people who already have some pre-existing uh, mental health issues and for us in the United States, that's defined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health. We call it the DSM-5. Um, those people are going to find that as you add this new load of stress onto what they're already experiencing, you're going to see that they can have some pretty strong reactions and difficulties. So um, with that, uh, last year, we know that we have had multiple events take place. And COVID-19 is obviously a big focus here for a mission connection. That's what they asked me to speak about. Um, but there's a lot of large scale and uh, mostly unresolved events that people are experiencing and have experienced in the last year. And for the most part, uh, aren't resolved yet. Many of those issues are ongoing. That's why we've been talking about prolonged and intense stress and the difficulty it is for people to kind of recover from that. That's because that's what we're all living in right now. And what we see across the board, which is unusual, is that it's actually affected the whole world. Now, of course, you know, in the United States, we have our bucket of uh, stressors. And if you go to Lebanon, let's say, you're gonna have a bucket of stressors there that are uh, different. But what we're seeing is obviously COVID is everywhere. And then we have uh, the governmental responses to that, which have not been necessarily great for people. And then we've seen other events that are taking on. We've seen uh, unrest politically, and you're going, yep, I've definitely seen that. 
Uh, we've seen explosions, and that reminded me uh, to bring Beirut into the picture. They've been through explosions. We've seen explosions. I think everybody has to some level. Even we had one on Christmas Day this year. We've seen uh, persecution and the threat of persecution rising, and uh, I definitely think that that is something we'll be dealing with in greater number as we're going forward. I don't think that's going down from this point where we're at. And we've seen separation uh, based on political unrest and COVID, and that separation is creating some severe problems. And we're going to actually do a whole course on that tomorrow, dealing with separation and what that is doing uh, to people individually and how we might be able to help. And separation obviously equals isolation. And so we have a lot of people who might not even have a spouse or children or pets or anything in their home and they're afraid or unable for one reason or the other to even go out a little bit and venture. And we're seeing the negative impacts of that upon people for sure. So additionally, on top of all these large stressors that we're talking about that are not uncommon, uh, we're also seeing people have their normal day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year stressors. And those, I hate to call them special stressors, but they're unique uh, to people such as the death of a loved one, uh, loss of a job, uh, difficulties with children or with a spouse, uh, chemical dependency, all those things that can pop in and create more stress. So I think it's fair for us to say right now that in our social circles, our family circles, even in our, ourselves, um, we can see that the stress load is really high and it is going to impact a lot of people and it already has. So um, add all that together and we kind of have a mess. So here's the problem. When we're dealing with powerful events um, that can come up, such as all the ones I've already listed, although they're uncomfortable, most people uh, tend to return to what we call their own adaptive functioning fairly quickly. Not all people, but most people. And I mean the higher category of people, 90% plus. They're uncomfortable they're still working through things for long periods of times in some cases, but they return to their ability to function in the world, to care for their kids, uh, to go to work, uh, to uh, get some of the basic things done around the house, to eat, uh, to meet basic hygiene needs, all those kind of things. So they, they start to return to that adaptive functioning, uh, even if really uncomfortable and still maybe even feeling fuzzy, fuzzy or like they're living somebody else's life or kind of distant and they're watching it from you know the, the screen, but it's their life. It, they can get back to the pieces that they have to, and that's important. And um, even they can begin to return to doing some of the things that are enjoyable, some of the things that they like to do, because we don't tend to, on a regular stress level, we don't tend to just keep going through the stress level like this. We, we go stress and our body can only take it for so long and we take a little reprieve and a break and then we'll come back up and then we'll take a little reprieve and a break and we'll come back up. And so what we're seeing is that most people in most places kind of return to adaptive functioning and they can even start fairly quickly to return to doing some of the things that are enjoyable. And because people are people and we're, you know, we're not um, a static units, we're actually living by it organisms, that's different for everybody. What that uh, window of time looks like is certainly different. Uh, but what we're seeing now in this problem is that these issues that we're dealing with are, again, prolonged and intense. And, and that's, a, that's a big piece uh, when we're talking about stress responses. When we as chaplains or trauma responders are looking at people and the events that they deal with, uh, even very, very powerful events when there is a conclusion or some type of closure to it, um, can often uh, be overcome through natural adaptive processes to, just to get back to life, to your own adaptive functioning and some self-care. But when events are prolonged and intense, they're the worst kind of stress. They're the kind of stress that starts taking a bigger pull, uh, toll on us personally, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, socially, and that's where we're at right now. We're talking about multiple factors that are prolonged and intense. And because of that, uh, we're going to see that, that we're going to have some outcomes here that are not just the normal thing that we deal with when grieving or suffering or going through some of those other things. And the next thing that we're going to see is because that's going to interfere with our adaptive functioning, um, that it's going to let some of those negative impacts because it's ongoing get entrenched. 
It'll be um, something that starts to rewire some people's way of viewing and thinking about things and the way that they function toward those things or respond to them. And I think many of you might already see that happening in people that you know and you love, uh, people you've associated with. And then finally, here's a big one that I think is really important right now. And, and I, I saw it almost instantaneously with COVID uh, within a few days or weeks. I guess that's not real instantaneously, but considering we've been at this for eight to nine months, it feels instantaneous. Right from the very beginning, what we saw is that uh, people were having stress responses but couldn't identify that there were stress responses. And you might say, well, why, why is that a big deal? It's a big deal because it means when they're unnoticed that people tend to not then deal with them in productive ways. They kind of let what's happening happen to them instead of understanding it and working through processes that will make it productive, uh, help them figure out how to start moving forward. So. Um, it really important for us to understand that a lot of people have not even noticed uh, the stress responses that they're having and they're attributing it to something else completely. So uh, then additionally, uh, the multiplying of all those stressful events together, which we call cumulative stress, is creating a big problem. We're, we're adding stress on top of stress, peace on top of peace. And so what I want you to think about for a minute is when we have any of the big ones, you know, the death of a loved one, uh, especially somebody who's close to you, a spouse, a child, um, somebody that's in your inner circle, or we're uh, personally violated, or uh, we are involved in something that just is unprecedented for us, and it's really painful. Any one of those can knock us off of our feet for a bit, and then we return to our adaptive functioning, hopefully. The majority of people do. And so, uh, if not, you know, that minority there, we get to counseling or some help to kind of give them a boost to get them moving forward again. But when we're talking about multiple small stressors that accumulate together, they can have the same response as one big stressor. Here's the problem. We have a lot of the big ones multiplying. So we have a cumulative stress of fairly significant and large events together, um, kind of nationally and internationally. And then we have our personal stressors that come up, which can be, again, the loss of a job or the loss of a loved one or interfamily conflict or a return to substance abuse or any of those things. And so we really are talking about kind of a perfect recipe for people to be in these prolonged and intense accumulative stress type of situations. And that's what we're all dealing with now. And that's what we're seeing. So uh, that's kind of what I want to talk about um, and help us figure out. So now let's get to people's responses. Um, the impact on emotional instability is, uh, again, really significant here because we, we know that, you know, as powerful things happen to us, we respond emotionally and it has some psychological response on this, but it doesn't just stop in that area. And that's a big piece for us to understand too. So we're gonna talk about the emotional psychological part, but we also have to talk about the relationship stress um, because it's a big one. So it's adding to the stresses that already exist. We need to talk about physical well-being or the impact of stress on our body and how to mitigate that and to identify it so we can do some things to help. We need to talk about our ability to function or return to adaptive function um, because a lot of people are losing that adaptive functioning. They can't concentrate, work, can't get things done, things of that nature. And we need to uh, talk about the cause of severe violations of a worldview, how we see ourselves in the world, what we think a just and fair world should be. And so what we're going to do now is I'm just going to go through all four of those and break them down a little bit more. And then we're going to talk about what we can maybe help people do to work through some of this stuff that's still mostly ongoing. And um, I want you to understand this part too. The reason I'm going to talk about these four a little more instead of just getting to what we can do is because you as the person who is going to help other people, hopefully, and maybe even for yourself. Um, you need to play detective a little bit. I was thinking of that earlier in Proverbs 18, 13. It says, he who gives an answer before he hears, it's a folly and a shame to him. 
And I think a lot of people who want to help other people start telling them things that they've done in the past that have helped them, uh, start giving them advice that they got from their mom or their pastor or something else, but it might not even line up to the thing that is affecting them or where their problem is kind of manifesting, how it's coming out in their response. So the first thing we have to do is be a great listener. We have to figure out what they're telling us is stressing them. And we have to play detective. It's kind of the fun part, actually, of doing trauma intervention, if there is any fun part, is that we get to play detective and maybe hear from them and then ask them to clarify if that's really the part that is causing them the most distress. And so I'm going to go through these four pieces and maybe just pay attention to them. And as you talk to others, see if these or other themes come up, because this isn't an all-inclusive list. These are just things I know get impacted through people's powerful uh, events and their responses to them. So let's deal with the first one, uh, the relationship stress. I, I think it's a really big one, and I bet it's almost everywhere uh, to varying degrees, of course. It might be a, a small little uh, interference in the relationships you have with others. It might be catastrophic. It might even come to the point of destroying some relationships, but we do know that relationship stress happens. When uh, stress overflows the boundaries that we're normally operating inside of, and uh, we start to try to figure out how we're going to uh, move forward, if we don't realize that we're having stress responses, if we're not attentive to the fact that the reason we're on edge, the reason that we uh, can't quite have the relationship significance we did before, if we, if we don't recognize that there's a cause behind that, then people misunderstand why you might be behaving the way you're behaving. It's why all romantic comedy movies uh, exist. Uh, they're romantic comedies, what's the deal? They start out in this scenario and they have communication errors. And those communication errors over and over again make the whole storyline. If they just said, well, the reason I'm being a jerk today is because I just got laid off from my job or they switched me to the night shift, people would probably be very compassionate and they would say, oh, I'm sorry, that's so terrible. How do we work through that together? Oh, I can adjust my hours, but they don't. In most of your romantic comedies, instead, they just kind of blurt out what, what they're emotionally feeling instead of telling the causation behind it. And then you're off and running to the conflict. And that's what we see so frequently with people right now who are having stress responses to all the powerful things and unresolved things going on is because if they push those things to the side or they refuse to realize that they're having a stress response, what's going to happen is that emotional bubbling up is going to come up into their other relationships. And then what happens to that is people misunderstand what's going on. They take it personally. They think it's a personal affront to them that the person has some kind of attitude or they're angry or they're and they think And so we do this a lot with uh, first responders that will go out and they will see some terrible event. And then we realize that they're gonna be impacted and now they're gonna go back home to their family. So as a chaplain, we'll stop and talk with them and help them figure out what to say to their family when they get home so that the, it doesn't create misunderstandings in them. They can go home and say something to the effect of, gosh, I have to tell you, honey, I was on a terrible call today. I I don't want to tell you all the details because I don't, I don't want to share them with you. They're kind of terrible, um, but it, it's kind of hit me. This one has some sticking power for me, and I'm, I think it's going to take me a couple days, maybe even a week or two to work through. Could you be patient with me as I don't even know how I feel about this yet? Part of me is angry. Part of me is sad. Uh, part of me just feels like this should never happen. And when they do that and we help them communicate that, then what happens is they go home and guess what? They don't create a new conflict based on misunderstanding because communication now is dealt with and it's put in its proper context. Well, that's part of the problem we're having with people's responses right now is they are not sharing that information. They're not identifying their own personal stress responses. And so it bleeds over into their communication. And now instead of having the stressors that they had all by themselves, they've added another one to it in a relational uh, stress when they actually need those relationships to get through the things that are going on. And again, 
uh, unresolved, not talked about, what we find is uh, beyond relationship problems, it can actually kill some relationships. Some relationships will just dissolve or they will not recover uh, from that misunderstanding. So uh, the next piece that we want to talk about is physical well-being. This is another area that I think a lot of people are getting hidden and don't even know yet at this point. Um, we know that sudden and stressful events uh, are unlikely to kill you. So, you know, if you get bad news, at a, uh, a death notification or bad news about something else, um, as a chaplain, we don't highly get concerned about that, that somebody's going to die. I've never seen it happen. I've never heard of it happening. I have heard of people who have pre-existing health conditions uh, getting hit and watching that pre-existing health condition come up. If they have a bad heart, um, obviously we're concerned about heart attack. We watch them. We try to get that information if possible. But somebody who's basically healthy and doesn't have any pre-existing health conditions, as you uh, give them bad news, it, it, it's not likely going to kill them. But what we do know is that stress over and over again has proven to be detrimental to our health. And it certainly can increase our likelihood of being sick, uh, reduce our immunity, and it can shorten our lifespan. Uh, we saw that through the ACEs study. Um, so it's the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. You can look it up, Kaiser Permanente put it on. And it showed that there were several factors for children that if they went through as a child growing up, that it actually had a very severe impact on their long-term physical and mental health. It's a, it's a great research study. You can study that a lot and it is very vast. So we can expect the same thing for adults and everybody in all age categories that unresolved stress is going to certainly do some things to us physiologically. We know that all people have um, commonly what we call a target organ. So that when stress happens, some people will hold it in their jaw. Uh, some people will feel it in their chest. Other people actually, man, they'll throw their back out and they'll have back pain issues. So we do know that people have target organs. Hit. Um, you probably know where you carry your stress. I know where I carry mine. And so we'll see some aches and pains and um, some tension building in that direction and people from the things that have gone on. But I also want to note that researchers in June determined determined that by June, because of COVID and political unrest, um, we saw in the United States of America a 12% increase in lupus, an 11% increase in MS, and the American Dental Association said we had an unprecedented number of cracked and broken teeth like they had never seen before. And so all of this being attributed to stress. So the real physical impacts of stress are taking place on people. And that's obviously gonna impact again, the relationship component. Because when you're stressed, you don't do as well. It's gonna impact the work component. It'll even impact the enjoyment components where you might go out and go hiking or engage in activities you used to do, but you don't feel physically well enough to do it or too exhausted to do it. So we know that's another piece that uh, is a response we'll see in people. Uh, the third one is the ability to uh, function uh, might be impeded. And we definitely see this um, all the time. We saw it long before COVID and all the unrest that's happening in our nation and all the division, all these pieces. Um, so we can see that it'll affect students' grades. Kids who used to be straight A students uh, really just are having trouble functioning in the classroom or even enjoying uh, studying anymore. And I have a lot of parents as the pastor of a church uh, I have parents in our church coming and saying, gosh, my student used to be a straight A student. Now they're barely getting through school. And I actually, uh, we were starting a new website for our church. And I was talking to the lady on the phone uh, who does the websites. And she started talking to me about her kids when she knew I, we did trauma intervention with children. And she said that very same thing. She said, my child loves school. And now that it's online, they hate school. I mean, uh, she can't concentrate. She can't get her work done. She can't a focus on what she needs to do. And so we know that that ability to function being impeded is a, uh, it's a stress response, which creates more stress. We see it in the workplace. Uh, we see it in the way people are having trouble maintaining their business functions. Uh, the poor restaurant owners of, you know, they're, they're trying to manage a business which takes uh, quite a bit of cognitive processing. And at the same time are working with a load of stress that says you might go bankrupt, you might lose everything. And that same cognitive processing now gets hit 
because of the stress level, meaning it's harder for them to do the work that they need to do when they're having to pretty much reinvent themselves uh, to try to stay alive financially. So we see these uh, impediments of function taking place for many people. And we can see again, this thing which we call persistent diminished problem solving. So when any of us gets hit by an event, we can have difficulty with problem solving. That's kind of a common response to very powerful events or uh, to our stress response system. Um, but what we need to understand is it can get to the point where it's persistent diminished problem solving. And as a chaplain or a trauma worker, uh, when it comes to that point, normally what I would do is I would actually refer them to some counseling to get them some assistance with some trauma intervention tools like EMDR, which is you know a process of moving the eyes back and forth through counseling to get all the brain functioning and working together to solve problems and calm the system down. Or I would get them involved in some other type of therapy that they could start to work with to get through that. And here's another one of the problems. Right now, counselors are booked to the max. And we're having trouble in some areas in the country uh, where counselors are not even actually taking people on a waiting list anymore uh, because they have so many people on the waiting list, they're not bothering. Um, we found that with the Santiam fires. We've been responding there and helping people who lost their homes there in Mill City and Gates and that area. And many of them have gone through a major trauma and that's exactly what they told us. They can't even get to a counselor. And I know many of you who are missionaries in other countries, you say, yeah, that's our day-to-day -day experience. Or maybe in the country you're in, there are no counselors. There are no trauma interventionists. So again, we're starting to see uh, kind of globally the impacts of this event. And we're having to come up with new solutions because even some of the resources we have are just tapped to the max at this point. But that's one of the things we're going to see is uh, their functioning or their re return to adaptive functioning just isn't going to be as quick as they want, and it's going to be slightly impeded for those who are trying to adapt. And then finally, four was the worldview. And a worldview is a big one. Um, it's a really big one that a lot of times gets overlooked. Worldview is how somebody sees themselves um, uh, adapting and fitting into the world, into society, into their place of usefulness, where they belong, who they connect with. And worldview can include also uh, how you see the world should be in your mind. It should be a just place. It should be a fair place. It should be a place where, you know, children don't get hurt. It should be, you know, and you can name it. But worldview is big and it is different in every country depending on where you're from. You know, if you see death and murder all the time, your worldview is going to be different than somebody who never sees that and basically lives in a really quiet area uh, with safe neighborhoods. But what we're seeing for everybody based on all the stuff going on is that a lot of worldviews are being challenged. And because um, of isolation of COVID-19, we're seeing that where people fit in where they connect, um, how they belong in the world and, and contribute to the world is really even being challenged right now. Again, giving us more of the prolonged and intense effects of everything that's going on, the stress that's building up. And you say, okay, so now that we're all depressed, what do we do? And uh, hopefully I can give you some advice that will help. I'm just gonna deal with a few areas here and I, uh, again, if you're wanting to chat on the side and ask questions, we'll come to those in probably about 10 minutes here and I'll try to answer some of those questions for you. Um, but here's what we can do at this point to help. The first thing is to assist people into understanding that the difficulties that they might be having at this time are stress responses and they're normal. Uh, we wanna normalize people's responses. What we know as chaplains is when I show up to somebody and they've been uh, experiencing a shock response because of some powerful event that's gone on, we as chaplains are trained to listen to the responses they're having, assess them, and then if they're normal, which they usually are, I'm going to tell you 90 to 95% of the time, they're normal, healthy responses of normal, healthy people to a very powerful or negative event. And so we listen and, and I tell them or we tell them, hey, I, after I've listened to you, I want you to understand everything I've heard you say so far is kind of what I expected to hear someone say who has been through what you've been through. And they're uncomfortable 
but your responses are normal. You're not losing your mind. You're not having a psychological break. Um, you're, you know, you're uncomfortable, but you're going to be okay as this all comes down. Now, that really is true, and it's important. And I'll tell you, when I talk to people, and based on what we've just talked even through this course and through the next three tomorrow, um, most people really are having normal responses. The question is, are they healthy? Um, because the stress is so prolonged and intense, I don't know that they're healthy for everybody. I, I've seen some people not respond healthy, but as I kind of do the mental map, with no background from data or statistics because we're still needing to compile that from everything that's gone on. I've talked with a lot of people through this time and I actually do think that I could say I believe they're healthy based on the situation. They're healthy and normal responses. And I'll tell you, even when I talked to somebody before all this went on and I would say to them, look, you're having normal responses of a healthy, normal person, they would make audible sounds like almost every time, like a groan of relief, like, <sighs> or they would say to me literally, oh, thank goodness, I thought I was losing my mind. It's like something I can count on almost 100% of the time. Because when you're in severe stress, that is a concern that everybody is paying attention to. We live in the era of WebMD, and everybody wants to self-diagnose and determine if they're really kind of losing it or not. So when you can verify for people and help them understand that the responses are happening, are based on all of the stressors that we're going through right now at this time, then you actually give them quite a bit because it helps kind of calm them down and take away that fear. Right now, many people uh, with each event that comes up and every powerful thing, they have what's most of your processing shuts down. It just quits operating and we move into a different system, more interior inside of the brain. It's called the limbic system. And in the limbic system, which we don't operate in unless we're having a shock response or having to go into that fight, flight, or freeze mode, it's very uncomfortable. It moves really quick. It's very emotionally laden. It's heavy in emotions. And it has no time clock. It can't keep track of time. That's why people will say in a powerful event, it felt like it was in slow motion or it took two hours and it was 10 seconds um, because it didn't keep track of time. And so a lot of people are dealing with these powerful events that are going through. And every time they get hit with something that initiates a shock response, they're going to feel very uncomfortable, even though it's normal. It's our job, if we want to be helpful, to help them understand what their brain's doing and what just occurred. So the front shuts off the prefrontal cortex where we normally operate and do life. And we kick into an interior part called the limbic system and you can call it the trauma response system. It's the part that deals with trying to make sure we're safe, others are safe. We're making moves and decisions quickly to, to make the right decisions. It's just really uncomfortable. So we wanna help them come to that understanding. It's big, I promise. Um, I talk with a lot of people in trauma, and that seems to be one of those tools that is in every intervention because people really do want to know why they're responding the way they are. And then we want to normalize their response again once we've explained them to them. I've said that a few times. We want to tell them that, that what they're uh, feeling and, and how they're having some difficulty is normal. It's not desirable. It's not what they want to do. It's not comfortable, but it is normal. And that helps people kind of calm down too. And you can even say, you know, it might be helpful for you to have some self-talk. And, and we all talk to ourselves. I know in the TV shows, when people talk to themselves, they're crazy. Everybody has some self-talk. Let's get real about that. And we can tell people, use some of that self-talk for yourself and say, okay, brain, I know what's going on. Uh, I, I know that you're trying to protect me. You're in an operational safety mode because we've had an emergency response. And I'm really uncomfortable, but I trust you. But you, brain, you can calm down now. You can let go. I've got this. And we found that actually really does help people to kind of talk through once they understand what's going to bring themselves back down. I know personally, I can tell you, I've had to use that for myself. Um, obviously, uh, being a chaplain or a pastor doesn't exclude us from dealing with difficult situations. And when I catch myself starting to have responses, a, a accumulative stress or a powerful shock response, I use the same tools for myself and, and they work. So self-talk works and maybe you need that right now too. 
Um, third, we're going to deal with helping them understand the importance of self-care and communication with others. So again, we talked about how communication can be hit. We talked about how our physical well-being uh, can be hit. And so what do we need to do? We need to help people once they identify what's happening to figure out what to do about it. I want to deal with self-care first. Um, every trauma worker we work with, and we train about 200 to 250 trauma workers a year, from hospital to fire to police to military to school teachers to chaplains, we teach a lot of them. And I say this, I think in every single course I teach, and we teach about 22 different courses, I tell them to create a self-care list uh, that they will use and to write down 10 things that they do for themselves or have done in the past when stressful or powerful events have thrown them. Now, for younger kids, they, they might not have a lot of those, but for adults, we've all had those times when we thought, wow, I don't know that I'll ever get over this, or wow, this is so powerful, how, how can I come back to normal? And what we find is we start to develop our own self-care techniques. For me, walking is big. Um, sometimes I sit and listen to some pretty horrific stories from people and help them process it and see the details. And, and then I found one of the best things I can do after I'm done with those scenarios is go on a 30 minute walk. And it honestly, it almost seems magical. I, I walk um, because I'm a believer in Jesus. I pray. And something about that just brings that stress down to a point where I feel normal enough again that I can return to adaptive function. I feel my heartbeat slow down. I feel the tension in my shoulders come down. I start to get back to more of my normal. But those things on your self-care list could be anything from uh, watching a funny movie, uh, listening to music, going out in nature, uh, kayaking, playing with your pets, uh, reading a book, uh, watching pet shaming videos. If you've never seen those before, uh, they're hysterical. Uh, animals who chew up their master's shoe and the master puts something around their neck that has, you know, some slogan and the faces that animals can make. I just laugh hysterically. But those kind of self-care things are important for us. And what we realize is that when we're having a powerful response to um, a powerful event, we forget to do the things we know. That's why we got to write them down. And so I have on a whiteboard because they change over time. I have 10 things that I do for self-care and it's posted in my office right at the door uh, because when I am not functioning well, when I am kind of feeling like, wow, this is getting to me, I will stop and do something on my self-care list. Maybe something that takes 15 minutes, maybe something that takes hours. Um, but it's really important for people right now to use self-care. I had a pastor friend of mine uh, say to me after they had a pretty big tragedy at their church that another pastor had mentioned to him that right now we just need more Sabbath. And I agree. While everything is crazy, more rest is important. And maybe that's on your health care list. For me, my self care list, uh, naps are on there. I love them. And I feel refreshed 15, 30 minutes later to get up. But here's a question for you. What's on your self care list? If you don't do this first, uh, you'll have a hard time to remember to do it with others or to explain it to them. But the minute you do it for you, it will stick and you'll be healthier for doing it too. And then communication. We need to help people figure out what's the best way to communicate uh, during this time. And I think honestly, uh, what we need to tell them is it's common for us and many to kind of hide behind the mask. You know, I'm okay. And every once in a while we peek out from around the mask and uh, we have a little bit of a meltdown or something if we need to um, but I think we need to be more intentional about the conversations we're having and maybe add a little bit more upfront. So let's say um, you've just watched too much news and you've hit overload. You feel your blood pressure rising or dropping, whatever it may be. And um, it kind of puts you in a funky mood. And now you're going to go out and interact with family. It would be good to say, gosh, I, I did something silly. I think I stayed in the news too long. And man, it has really emotionally hit me right now. I, uh, it, it might take me a minute to get out of this. Would you just be patient with me and maybe give me a little bit of room to kind of maneuver around this? I'm sorry, but I, I, I feel stressed. I feel angry. I feel whatever it is. But by letting them know what you're stressed about or what you're angry about or what has happened and then what you need, what will happen then is you won't compound the relationships that you have. 
And so those are conversations we use as chaplains frequently. We tell people to actually sit down and write certain things that they want to say and that they don't want to say. Uh, things that they would prefer don't come out of their mouth. Just go through the exercise of doing it. And I think this is an important time to work that out too. Tell people to tell other people what they need, what they're feeling, um, and, and why they're having the responses they are. First, it makes them have to deal with that themselves. Hey, I'm having a stress response. Hey, I'm impacted by this event. And they have to get real with it. But next, it won't cloud their relationships with the people that they love and care for. And then we want to get um, back to the Bible, obviously. That, that is my pastoral piece. But I, I want to give you some advice on telling people to get back to the Bible because there can be, in stressful situations, good ways to do that and bad ways to do that. And I will share some of my own experience on that as a pastor. I love the Bible. We teach chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I teach three messages a week, um, different ones because we want people to be in the Word. But what we found with people who are in trauma and stress is Psalms seem to be one of the best places to be. Uh, they're very personal. Um, even as you listen to David, he uh, oftentimes is just very real about his emotions. You can see sometimes where he's almost clinically depressed. Uh, you can see other times where he's angry, sometimes where he is actually in fear, um, sometimes where he feels injustice in the world. And he will call out to God. And then at the end, he surrenders to God. He realizes who God is. He declares who God is. He makes that uh, uh, proclamation. And then he just puts it all in God's hands. So we found that Psalms are a really good place for people to uh, come to and kind of reconnect during times of stress. I think it's a great uh, process to read a Psalm a day and go through that. Um, but as we talk to people um, about the Bible and trauma, I want to say that when somebody's just had a very powerful shock response, something really big has just hit them, it's probably not the time to bring that up to them unless they bring it up to you. Um, a shock response means their brain just isn't really functioning the way that it normally does. And so to pray with them is, to great, is a great thing. Uh, to wait and kind of engage in the conversations that they would bring up are really good. And then wait for the shock response to come down and bring them back to those places. Um, I will tell you that I have worked with pastors who have gone through some difficult tragedies and have uh, made the mistake of immediately pulling up a verse earlier on in my, my uh, pastoral career, even my time as a Christian, uh, to be rebuked. Um, because they're having shock response. They're not norm working in the normal part of their brain that they function in the vast majority of the time. And so give them a chance to come out of that and follow their lead. Uh, the next thing I would tell you is when trauma comes, uh, even though we could be working entirely with other followers of Jesus, it doesn't mean that some of the pieces that bring us comfort bring them comfort. And you might find that weird, um, I can personally tell you that I was dealing with a, a, um, a group, a Christian organization in another country who had a very large explosion. And because I had done training for them before, um, they called uh, with their staff to do kind of a group tri crisis intervention. And, um, I, you know, honestly, it got to the point where I jumped in at one point and began to use some eschatology pieces uh, dealing with end times and the, the excitement that we can have in preparing for the Lord. And I, I don't ever do that. But I, I had been in there so much recently because of where we're at in the world. And then when I finally got off that conversation, uh, the leader of that group, about 25 people, called me back and said, you did a great job. I mean, a great until you started in on the eschatology part, because we have a lot of people who in our organization are Coptic Christians or uh, they come from around the world and they're here and they just don't believe in the same thing. And I think you offended some and you lost some. Now, I again, I believe very firmly in the Bible, but they're on a shock response. And I brought theology into uh, that conversation that for them was questionable. You know, will there be a rapture? Will the Lord return? Will those pieces uh, happen in that way? Or is it going to be different? And so I just want to encourage you that when people are having shock responses, you know, pretty fresh to the event, that you might want to pull back and listen to them, pray with them, uh, and then 
if you can, through other encounters, maybe in a day or two or three, then you can start to bring up some of those conversations in theology that maybe you find helpful and bring them back to the Psalms. That's what I would suggest. And then finally, um, encourage engagement at the highest level. And what I mean by that is we're trying to help people is we know people have been made for people. We're going to deal with that in one of the other courses tomorrow. Uh, we'll deal with that in depth. I'll give you some research studies and findings too, and the impacts of not being able to engage with people like we used to, uh, even going to church, uh, hugging, uh, touching, communicating. And I know that not everybody feels the same about the COVID-19 responses at this point. So this is what I'll say. Tell people to engage at the highest level they can and to be intentional about it. If they can go to church and they're comfortable going to church, they really should. If they can meet with other people face-to-face, -face, that would be the highest level of engagement, and they really should. If they can't, instead of taking a phone call, do a video call. That would be better. Instead of sending a text, a mail a letter actually would be better because somebody has something physical and tangible to hold on to, to read, to review. There's something more personal about it. So we just want to tell people that at this point, they need to be intentional about engaging at the highest level possible with other people. It, it's really important to who we are and to how we recover and how we deal with stress and let stress reside. Um, we're gonna deal with actual the physical, log, physiological changes that take place when human touch occurs tomorrow in one of the other courses. So with that, I think I've concluded, hopefully we've dealt with all the parts uh, the problems that are occurring, people's responses, and things we can do. And now we are going to kind of come to that point where if you have questions, um, you can ask those questions. And I don't know if I can unmute you. I'm sorry, I'm not technologically a superstar here, but I know that you can type them into the chat piece and I can see those and then I can respond. So here's one. If yes. They could unmute themselves and ask the question too. Okay, great. I'm going to deal with the first one from Sharon, who's in the uh, the chat. And Sharon says, "What does the psychological breakdown look like?" Um, so, Sharon, here's how I'd answer that. Um, knowing somebody's history obviously is important. We know that some people um, can have bipolar one, two, or a variant of bipolar, and all of a sudden stressful events happen. And what might look like a psychological breakdown in somebody who doesn't have bipolar would look like it in bipolar, but the bipolar person's actually just going through one of the cycles or they're having some uh, difficulty in the adjustment, um, but it might not be a breakdown. So history does matter. Their history does matter. Let's talk about somebody who doesn't have any of those pieces. Uh, they don't have any postpartum, no bipolar, no seasonal affective disorder, none of those uh, conditions at all taking place. Uh, what we might see in a psychological breakdown are that the responses they're having don't seem to subside. So if we go to a really powerful event, let's say that somebody comes and tells you a person that you love has just died. You're probably going to have a shock response. It's unexpected information. Your brain's going to switch from the prefrontal cortex into the limbic system. And the way you're going to respond now is going to be very quick, very emotionally laden, um, you might have even that, uh, that chemical dump in your head that causes fight, flight, or freeze responses in you. Um, we know this to be true. Now, we expect for you know, days, maybe even weeks, and for some people, could be a month, that they uh, really are uncomfortable and can't connect with people. They might, might not be able to get back to their own adaptive functioning, you know, uh, taking care of basic hygiene, eating, uh, getting up, communicating with others. That's a kind of expected or could be expected. Not everybody will do that, but many will. What we start to see in a psychological break is that it is prolonged and intense. Um, if they keep going that direction, they don't come back to bathing or brushing their teeth or eating or cleaning their house or letting their pets out or re-engaging in work. And we have to maybe use that as uh, one sign that maybe a psychological break has occurred. The other thing that we can look for is, um, are their responses, uh, what, how they're responding to this powerful event, are they um, normal in what we'd expect or are they kind of psychologically disconnected from reality? For example, somebody might say, 
you know, um, gosh, when my brother died in that car accident, I, I heard him scream. And now everywhere I'm walking, I'm hearing him scream. And we would ask a question like, well, do you actually physically hear him scream or is it a remembrance of that scream? And if they were to say it's a remembrance, we say that's a pretty normal, that's a normal deal. But if they say that they're actually physically hearing him scream, like they hear it auditorily from uh, external sources, then we know that that's a bigger deal. They're actually having a little bit of a flashback or hallucination or disassociation. And so those can be complicated things to see in people if that's not a common thing that you're doing. But duration of their response and intensity of their response is important because many of the things that somebody might do for a short period of time uh, could be normal, but when it becomes prolonged and intense responses, uh, then it might be a psychological break. But all of that is diagnosed here in the US primarily through um, what we call the DSM-5 or Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, a fifth edition. And so if in doubt, ask them if they'd be willing to go see somebody. Okay, and then we had somebody else who had a question. Was it Roberta at some point? No. Any other questions? You can unmute yourself and ask a question or you can type it in the chat section there. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> well, if there are no further questions, we can conclude this meeting if you'd like. If you do come up with questions or you'd like some more uh, resources, you can send us an email at freedom info at freedomcommunity.church. So info at freedomcommunity.church. All right, we do have one more question from Tiffany. How do you help someone respond respond to stress who has dementia? Uh, boy, that is a really challenging one. It's, a, it's pretty much a specialized area that I don't know that I have the specialty uh, to answer that question for. I'm sorry, I don't deal a lot with people who have dementia. Uh, but again, I do know that human interaction and touch or even interaction with animals and pets is important. Interaction with music, music that they're familiar with is important. Um, but we as chaplains do what we call the ministry of presence. And it's probably the number one thing that chaplains who are first responder chaplains do. They show up and they realize they're not gonna fix anything. They're not gonna solve all the problems that are there. Some problems you just can't fix. Some things can't be undone. Um, but they're there meeting the basic needs. Uh, just being with people matters. So I would say that's probably a big one. Okay, um, then we have Cheryl Jensen. Please type the email. Oh, we'll type the email address uh, in here in just a minute, Cheryl. So you'll get that from Annette in just a second. And uh, have the procedures for interviewing distressed first responders changed in the last 10 years? Um, I would say for that question, uh, if the procedures for interviewing distressed first responders has changed in the last 10 years, I would say probably not a lot. The standard of care is what we call psychological first aid. And it's what we use with first responders in general public and schools and students and all of them. And uh, the basic model that we use is called critical incident stress management. You can uh, take courses from us actually at Responders Resource Center and we can send you information for that. We do teach uh, four of those courses and about 18 other courses on trauma intervention. But I would say one of the problems that we've experienced is a lot of people who are required as trauma interventions to take CISM courses um, don't uh, actually use those tools enough. And so I know first responders frequently uh, get a little bit less than what's available in some areas because people don't actually stick to the models and tools that work. Uh, I really believe strongly in the models and I use them uh, frequently and I've used them here nationally, internationally from uh, preschool age kids up to um, you know the oldest of ages and they have worked really well. So I wish more people would stick to the models and we would happily help people. Okay, do you have advice for helping someone who has gone through a family tragedy and is, at angry, and is angry at God 
and as a result does not want to go to counseling. Yeah, boy, that's one of those areas where um, a lot of people will get angry at God. It's one of the five domains that we expect uh, people to have responses in. So it'll be emotionally, um, physically, behaviorally, psychologically, and spiritually. And so spiritual um, kind of secession of faith practices can definitely take place when somebody has had a loss. Usually it's um, a misunderstanding in theology, and there's a lot of theology that's actually not very helpful, and it's not biblically correct. And so we understand that God in the Bible has told us that um, it, there are losses in this life. There are difficulties and trials that uh, we will die in this body, but we live with him eternally. Unfortunately, a lot of the messages we hear are kind of cheerleading messages only, and they don't deal with the fact that the Bible has uh, suicide, it has sexual assault, it deals with what I see as clinical depression and situational depression, uh, it deals with loss and trauma, and it deals with all those pieces. So what I would first of all say is that for somebody like that, we want to obviously pray for them, and we want to let them know that it's okay to be angry at the situation, but the answer that they're actually looking for are in God. Now, when will they start to listen to that? I don't know. This is how I deal with suicides frequently. Um, people who have lost somebody through a suicide often feel like there's all these answers that they need to have, um, or all these questions they need to have answered in order to be okay. And the reality is they're just probably not going to get many of those answers. And so I have to say to them, look, I know you feel really strong at this time uh, about what's going on, but it, emotionally you believe some things and cognitively you believe other things. And I really believe that what's going to happen is as time passes a little bit here, as this thing comes down, as you start doing some self-care stuff and you continue to pray, what's going to happen is the emotional things are going to kind of fade down and what you know to be true will remain. And so even if uh, you're having trouble grabbing that right now, just hang on what you, uh, to what you know is true. I, I love the saying that says, never doubt in times of darkness what you were sure of in the light. And uh, so that, that's about as much as I can say right now is just to keep being a friend. Don't push. Do a lot of good listening more than giving advice because that's a form of counseling in itself, letting people put words to their indescribable experience, uh, acknowledge that a terrible thing has happened, and keep gently leading them back to uh, connecting with God. And again, I, th I think the Psalms are a great place to do it. Uh, next question, do you encourage or suggest lay members of churches to become trained in trauma intervention? Uh, not only do I encourage it, I almost beg you to do it. And the reason I would say that is there's a lot of people with really good intentions and amazing hearts um, that actually can wound people that they're intending to help. And so we actually have a chaplaincy training program here, and we also train trauma intervention courses, which is a little lesser step than having to go all the way to, through chaplaincy. Uh, we train them to go back to their churches and serve in their churches under their pastoral staff so that people can get more help that actually helps. So yes, I would really highly encourage you. I don't know anybody who isn't going to um, deal with somebody who's been through a divorce, a, a death, a job loss, a, a diagnosis of some type that is not favorable. And so yes, I would really encourage people to get some training. It's really important. Um, and are your courses in person or online? Uh, where are you located? So we are in Vancouver, Washington, and our courses are not online because they're all interactive. So we don't just sit and lecture you uh, like I have pretty much done here in this last hour. We actually uh, teach those courses and they have role plays and interactive pieces because we want to make sure we're not just giving you information, we're having you practice the tools so that when you walk out, you can use them. Folks, I think that's the end of our course now. It is about six o'clock. I want to thank you so much for attending, and I hope it was helpful to you. And uh, yes, these sessions are recorded, and they will be available through Mission Connections, so you can watch them at a later time. Thank you. Uh, God bless you. Have a wonderful evening, and keep praising Jesus. Amen.